like so just tip the will be great. Okay, good morning. Yes, it's only an empty tomb that you hear impersonations of Dunk Holiday. <laughs> yeah. You made that move. So we say to the devil, I'm your Huckleberry. Yeah. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this Sunday. And today, Lord Jesus, this message about Pentecostal power. Amen. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will just move, take this vessel, use this vessel any way you see fit. Speak what you would have the people hear, what I would hear. And Lord, do what only you can do. I pray that shackles would be set free today that would be broken by the power of the Word of God as it goes forward. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you a couple of announcements. We want to pray for Dean Frost. Dean's one of ours, and he is in the hospital right now with Corona, the first one that we know of that has had it. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for our brother Dean. We just pray that this, this curse, this, this sickness, this pestilence, would, would be totally driven out of his body. They'd be totally healed by the power of Jesus' name. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen. We love you, Dean. So, I think next week we'll be able to come together as a body. That's my plan. Next week, which will be Mother's Day, we'll be able to come together again. Now, they want us to, we can sit together as families, but we've got to be socially distanced. We'll, we'll do our best. But uh, we are really wanting to get the family back together and to pray in, pray in unity. I miss everybody. Jerry, bring this down just a little bit, will you? I really miss seeing everybody, seeing all the smiling faces. The ones who came here today were under 10, I think. Close, yeah. And so we're in good shape. Today at 1 p.m., there's going to be a prayer walk for life on 24th and J Street. And uh, Becky and Virgil Patlin has put this together with other church groups. There's going to be some pastors there, and we are going to prayer walk. We're going to do it responsibly. But we want a prayer walk uh, from 24th and J, I believe, down to O Street and around. Just kind of spread out. And we just want to go out and touch people in Jesus' name. Touch them, yeah, not touch them with their hands. <laughs> Spiritually. Spiritually touch them. As we just prayed a few minutes before we went on live, that, that their hearts would be warmed like the two men on the road to Emmaus. So if you can come join us, please do. We'll have a time of prayer and repentance ourselves, and then we're just going to go out and, and let people know that life is important. Life is important to God, that abortion is always wrong, and that we need to come together as a church and say, enough. We want to stand for, our, for the ones who can't stand for themselves. Amen. So this week I want to speak to you for the book of Acts. I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, because... I believe today in the church that we are lacking Pentecostal power. Now, I'm not talking about the denomination of Pentecostalism. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Pentecostal power, the power from on high. Sometimes I think Pentecostals think they have the, they have the lease on all the power. They don't. The, the early disciples were just followers of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And I think sometimes we make it, we make it, too difficult. It's not that hard. Come by faith. Give your life to Jesus and he will send the promise. That's what he told him. So in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 1, in the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that are his fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, 
They were all together with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah. This is one of the greatest days in all history. Not just church history, in all history. When Jesus Christ was born and the earth actually felt him walk on it, what a day. When Jesus Christ taught, when somebody could literally go sit in the very presence of God and look into his eyes and be touched by him, be healed by him, what a day, what a time. When the earth took him into the tomb and witnessed his suffering when his blood was poured out on the earth that he created for our sins. What a day that was. And when the tomb could no longer hold him, when there was an earthquake that rolled away this mighty stone that the Roman soldiers said, it'll take many to move it. It didn't take that many. Just a word. And then Jesus stepped out onto the earth again. The resurrected Jesus. What a day. What an awesome day. And then Jesus, he comes, he spends time with his disciples and he tells them, don't go to Galilee. Wait. Wait for the promise. So I want to talk to you about this power. So this was such an inspiring day. So Jesus lived, he taught, he loved, he performed healings and miracles. He was arrested, he was mocked, he was, he was heated, he was beaten, he was hated, he was mercilessly whipped, he was crucified, he died and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he appeared to Mary. John and I were just talking about that today. Jesus rises from the dead. Who does he appear to first? Not Peter, not John, the disciple whom he loved. Mary Magdalene, a woman with whom he had cast out seven spirits. Amazing. He appeared to two men on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to his disciples later. And then again, a week later, he had to come back because Thomas wasn't there the first time and Thomas wasn't going to believe it unless he heard it or unless he saw Jesus face to face and put his fingers in, his, in the nail prints and his hand in the side where the spear had thrust him to make sure he was dead. He appeared to 500 witnesses. 500 witnesses saw Jesus. He ascended into heaven. He sits now at the right hand of the Father. Now, why am I talking about the cross? Why am I talking about suffering and resurrection? Because I think every time you come together to preach anything, you better preach about the cross. You better preach about the suffering. You better preach about the death. You better preach about the resurrection. Because if there's no cross, it ain't about Jesus. If there's no cross, there's no hope for us. So the cross is always going to be part of our message. And it'll always be wherever I am. Right there. So the disciples were all together. Here's the thing. So Jesus told them to wait, and they did. They waited. They stayed there. And then there was this day. There was a hush. Then there was this wind a blowing that everyone in the city heard. Everyone heard this blowing wind. The rush of a mighty wind. It didn't say it was a wind. It sounded like a wind. Wouldn't it be something to be standing outside and Hearing something sounds like a wind, but there's no wind. Everybody heard it. And then the disciples, the apostles, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, loudly, boldly. There was fire on each one of them. Reinhard Bunke said, a flame for every head. And there's still a flame for every head today. So this is what I told John this morning. The, the word of God says the people all came together because they heard this noise and they heard these men of Galilee speaking in their own native languages. Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, people from Mesopotamia, all these places. It was awesome to me. Is it wasn't just the Jews. Right away, God was showing you and showing us that the message of Jesus was for the Gentiles. They were praising God in, in not the Hebrew language, but languages from all over the world. It's funny that they didn't catch, the apostles didn't catch that earlier. So, the fire had fallen. So, I want to talk about the character of this power. Jesus said, stay in Jerusalem. You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power for testimony and for service. He will take your fear and turn it into boldness. 
The apostles were hiding in the upper room, scared to death. I watched Jesus of Nazareth this year, and I thought they depicted it well when Mary came to tell the disciples in the upper room that she had seen the Lord. They were hiding, and they were saying, I think one of them came in, and they said, did somebody follow you? Nobody followed us. I mean, they were scared. They were looking for the disciples. And then suddenly, God said, here they are. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit came on them, and so there was no more hiding, they all just came out, and Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to preach. So they went from fear to boldness. They went from hiding to preaching. They went from understanding to, and, and or from not having understanding to having understanding and wisdom. Suddenly, I remember when I gave my life to Jesus 35 years ago. Suddenly, everything was different. I knew things that I did not know before. And there was really, I can't understand why I couldn't have known it. They seemed to me base elementary things, but I couldn't see. The carnal mind cannot receive the things of God. And I had not yet had that experience with Jesus. Last night I was listening to Billy Graham. And Billy Graham was many years ago when he preached this, his hair was still gray, not white. And he was preaching at a Baptist convention. And he was telling the story how when he went to preach the gospel in Poland, he wasn't sure to expect, what to expect because they were still a communist nation. He said that the bishop of Poland met him at the airplane and gave him a big hug and just said, the churches are all open to you. Poland is a very Catholic nation. And so he was preaching his gospel like he always did in the cathedrals in Poland. And after having some time with the the, over there and seeing the people being touched and mightily changed, the bishop asked him if he wouldn't mind going into the back study with him just for a few minutes, and they did. And when they went back there, the bishop said, Mr. Graham, I, am, I have a master's in theology. I'm the bishop of Poland. He said, but I am not sure I've been born again. And Billy Graham led him to Jesus, prayed the sinner's prayer with him, talked to him about the scripture, and he gave his life to Jesus. He got a, a letter, a year later, he got a letter from that bishop and said, Mr. Graham, something happened to me that day in that study. You can have all kinds of theological knowledge, but if you've not had an encounter with Jesus, you're not born again. We need to be born from above, and that's what happened to these guys, and then they were filled with the Spirit of God. So they have the character of his power, from fear to boldness, hiding to preaching, and you have understanding and wisdom. Then you have the source of the power. The source of the power is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God himself wielded the sword of the Spirit. He comes into our lives. To me, I can be sitting down here docile as a church mouse until it's time to preach. And it's like the Holy Spirit just flips the switch and he takes over. I, I really believe that. I told him, Father, you speak to these people. They're not my people. I didn't die for them. I don't know their hurts. I don't know their hearts, but you do. And if you could feel what I'm feeling now, I could be standing in a refrigerator and I'd be hot because the Spirit of God is on me. And I love it because he's the source of the power. God living in and preaching through us, living in and healing through us, living in and loving through us, feeding through us, giving water through us, counseling through us. God, Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus wants to fill you with the same spirit, the same power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now dwells in us, Paul said. Can you imagine? Why do we sit on our hands? Why don't we see more miracles? Why are we so unbelieving? When Jesus went to Jairus' house, they were crying. There was a tumult. They were weeping. And Jesus said, do not weep. The child is not dead, only sleeping. That's my granddaughter. At home. She must have liked that message. But Jesus, you know, faith sees what fear can't see. Amen. Faith sees what the natural eye can't see. When Jesus came to Lazarus, the woman said, Martha, or Mary, one of them said, he said, take away the stone. But Lord, he's been in there four days by now. He's going to stink. Jesus wasn't going to hear that. He said, take away the stone. When you're walking in the Spirit of God, you're not dealing on the same playing field with people who aren't. 
you have that extraordinary ability. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost will come upon you. God living in us. So what is the human conditions to this power? In other words, what had the 120 done to prepare the way for this coming of the Holy Spirit into their life? What did they do? Let's look at it. Number one, they were totally surrendered to Christ. He told them in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, don't leave Jerusalem, stay until the Father sends the promise. They obeyed him. That's one thing they did. And then you go to chapter 2 verse 1 on the day of Pentecost. All the disciples were meeting together in one place. They were all in one accord. They were all together. They were obedient. The disciples recognized their need. Acts chapter 1 verse 14 all these were continually united in prayer along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. They recognized they had their need. We need the Holy Spirit. I'm scared. I'm afraid. Jesus, you told us to go make disciples of all nations. Or, you, you know, you talked about making them fishers of men. How are we going to do that? We can't even go outside. We're afraid to go outside. They recognized their need. There must be a clear recognition of what you need. The disciples, here's another one, they intensely desired. For 10 days, they prayed and thought about Pentecost or about this coming. Lord, when are you going to come? When are you going to come? When are you going to come? What is the promise? What is the promise? Jesus said, stay. Uh, the Father's going to send it. Now it's just waiting. 10 days they waited, waited, waited. Then they prayed. They prayed together. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Some of you Christians out there, now if you believe in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. But are you filled with the Holy Spirit? That's the difference. You can't have the Holy Spirit because if, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you're not His. But we need to be full of the Holy Spirit. I've done this here at Empty Tomb for, for years. I've got a cup of coffee here. I haven't drank much of it. If I want this thing to be filled with pure water, I'm going to have to dump out all the coffee, scour it, clean it, disinfect it, do everything I have to, then put pure water in it in order for this to be filled with pure water. In order for me to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I need to empty out all the garbage that's in my life. All the hate, all the prejudice, all the unbelief, all my stupid, stinking thinking, we got to get rid of it. Rid yourself of those things. Pray. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? How many of you are saying, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit? The Bible tells us we're supposed to die every day. So if this Steve dies today, tomorrow Steve needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You understand? So if you die today in Christ Jesus, then tomorrow... That tomorrow, that if God gives you a tomorrow, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every day we should say, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, they couldn't even wait tables unless they were full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Nowadays, we've got people in churches, executives, elders, deacons, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit, but they have a good bank account, they have a good job. They're good business leaders. That is not a qualification for being the leader in the church. Amen. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Wise. So the disciples prayed. The disciples believed. They expected. 1 John 5, 14. Now this is the confidence we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petition that we have asked for. Do you know what it says in John 14, 12? Truly, truly, I say unto you that he that believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. Jesus never spoke for nothing. Every word has a purpose. Every word you can stake your life on. We should be seeing people healed of sicknesses. We should be seeing eyes open, ears opening, lives being changed. The dead raised. You know, I've been raised from the dead years and years, hundreds of years, thousands of years. In the 20th century, and I'm quite sure in the 21st century. Miracles still happen. 
but we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, how did this happen? Number one, the Spirit spoke. They spoke in spirit power. God gave up, or they gave up their own strength and wisdom for God to use. We need to do the same. We need to give up everything. God, here I am. I tell people sometimes I just want to be a puppet for Jesus. I want to give up my own agenda. I want to give up my own life. I want to give up my own desires. You speak through me, Lord. Use me any way you see fit. Whether I live or die, it's totally up to you. Not up to me. You could say, well, I have choice. No, you really don't. God is the boss, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. But one day you will. I encountered a man one time, told me he was an atheist. I said, I don't believe in atheism. Stopped him in his tracks. I said, the Bible says every man has a certain amount of faith. And the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I said, so you just choose not to acknowledge Jesus, but someday you will. And I just regurgitated that on this guy. Because that's just what I said. And he, boom, he just stopped him in his tracks. You know, I thought he'd never talk to me again. But he did. He used to come back and talk to me. I don't know if he ever got saved. And I sure hope he did. I know he's died. Then they had to testify to the mighty works of God. Oh my goodness. We talk too much about ourselves. I see some of the things some of the pastors are posting on Facebook and some of the things, me, 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 me. You know, showing off my muscles, showing off my cars, showing off, what in the world? We're not supposed to be talking about us unless you're talking about what Jesus did in your life. The Bible says people are set free by word of our testimony. The only thing we really need to be talking to people about is Jesus. Seriously. When all is said and done, when the rubber hits the road, the only thing that's going to matter is who Jesus Christ was for you. Was he your Lord and Savior? How much time have we wasted on frivolous talk? They don't talk enough. They didn't talk about themselves. Self has, they lied to themselves. That's what we need to do. Lose sight of yourself. When you got your eyes on you, you're in the, you got your eyes on the wrong thing. Put your eyes on Jesus. Let him run the show. They preached Christ. That's what we need to do. We need to preach Christ. Some of these sermons that I see that go on out there, it's just like, how is God glorified by this? I mean, I don't think any church really needs to be preaching on tithing. I don't know why preach, you know, let's preach, let's get people saved. God will take care of the givers. Yeah. He'll teach them how to give. Let's not preach on tithing and put everybody to sleep. It says here in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Men of Israel, hear the words. This is Peter after the Spirit of God came on him. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and signs and wonders that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus Delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised up. He raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for, them to, for him to be held by it. As David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness in your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is here with us today. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, and he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore highly exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. So what was the results? Multitudes were perplexed. Multitudes were amazed. People from Jerusalem came. When the Spirit of God is moving, people will be amazed. People will be perplexed. God 
He knows how to let people know he's real and it's him. Sometimes at my store just this week, I had a word for this lady. I didn't know who she was. I spoke what God put on my heart. And she was astounded that I could know that. And I told her, sis, God's in your business. He knows everything about you. He, he confirms it's him. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying, what does this mean? Some mocked. Some said they were filled with new wine. Some men were pricked to the heart. That's the genuine conviction. When someone's really convicted, I hope somebody out there is listening to me today and you, your heart is just tugging on you saying, get right with Jesus. Get right with Jesus today. I, I pray that be so. Genuine conversion. They said that day, 3,000 people got saved. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached one ser sermon under the unction of the Holy Spirit reached 3,000 people. Today, 3,000 sermons will be preached somewhere in this country and not one convert will come. It is a shame because it's, you have to preach under the Holy Spirit, under the unction of the Holy Ghost. And they, des they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, and the breaking of bread. There was unity in the church. The Holy Spirit is not the author of dispensationalism and and denominationalism. He's not the author of that. He is not the author of confusion. He is unified. We are unified in Christ. So can we have this same power and simil similar results? Yes. If we meet the same conditions. What are those conditions? Well, you got to be born again, number one. You have to be born again. If you're not born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. If you're not born again, the Holy Spirit will not come into your life. But the apostles received, the Bible says they were totally surrendered. They were wholly surrendered to what God had told them to be. We need to be wholly surrendered. If you're not wholly surrendered to God today, and I mean wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, totally surrendered, come to God and say, God, teach me how to totally surrender myself to you. You have to be that way. Obedient. The apostles were obedient. He told them to stay, they stayed. He told them to wait, they waited. What is he telling you to do that you're not doing? Why do we always try to run out ahead of God? Wait. Some of these young Christians are always trying to run out. And, and, and I appreciate the zeal. When I first got saved, I was witnessing the trees. I was so crazy. And I was ridiculous. But then I learned to wait, wait. Father sent me away for a couple of years out of, out of the area where it was just me and my family. Didn't even have a church family. But my time with God was sweet. Recognize your need. You need to recognize you need this power in your life. You need this. What if you're just say, man, I'm a Christian, but I don't know this power. I don't have this desire in my heart. I don't have this hunger for souls. You have not because you ask not. Ask him, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me a hunger for souls. Forgive me of my wretched arrogance. Get off the throne of your life. You ain't, and I'm not that important. It's all about Jesus. When we're standing up there with him, there's a problem. We need to get down low and let him do the standing. There's an intense desire. You have to have an intense desire. Somehow, I've gone to sleep way too many nights in these 35 years without being too concerned about people going to hell or heaven. I confess that to be so. So I ask the Lord, don't give me any peace over this. We need to have a desire for souls. We have to have an intense desire for souls. The things of this world are not that important. Here we've just gone through this corona thing and, and uh, so many people are just completely, totally focused on it and everything. And You know, honestly, I'm not. And I want to be wise and I want to be you know, responsible. I just want to share the gospel wherever I can and I want to do what God's called us to do and my focus is to just reach as many people as we possibly can. I pray we do today. The apostles prayed. Do you pray? I mean, pray. Tuesday nights we pray down here for revival. Been doing it for years. It's open for anybody in the city. We've kept our numbers up 10 but if that's the case, we must have been having coronavirus for about 15 years because we never get over 10, very rarely, because people don't go to prayer meetings. People, you need to pray. We need to pray together. You need to pray by yourself, and you need to pray together. 
I pray that this coronavirus has caused people to pray. I pray that this coronavirus has caused people to seek God. They believed. They expected God to keep his word, to do his part. You need to do the same. I need to do the same. God will do his part, but you have to do your part. What is your part? Stop being caught up in all this frivolous things. Get about God's business. Jesus told us, well, the first thing recorded that Jesus as a man ever said in the Bible was, why did you look for me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? Don't you think that was a little message from Jesus to all his little brothers and sisters saying, don't you know you must be about your father's business? Are you about your father's business? Have faith. Have faith. Fear looks, faith leaps into action. Fear looks, faith leaps. Faith turns kitty cats into lions. Wigglesworth said, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved by what I believe. Now let me give you two scriptures and I'll leave you alone. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, one of my very favorite scriptures. Some people will say, oh, this Pentecost, you know, it's not for today. Or is that correct? The Bible says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And my goodness, if we ever needed the Holy Spirit, we need you today, Lord. We need you today, Lord. He didn't leave us. If he left us, we're in trouble. He's here. There's no way he would leave us alone. He knows us. Acts chapter 2, verse 39. He's talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone with whom the Lord our God shall call. The promise is for everyone whom the Lord our God has called. If you're a Christian, you are being called to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. For God to come into your life and transform you, to make you another person. To use gifts that you didn't even know you had. Some of you, you've got gifts in you. You just haven't experienced them. Gifts and calling are without repentance. God has, we've been born with gifts. A lot of us from God. How is it that Sam Kennison, you know, that comedian, he was raised in a Christian home. And that guy walked away from God. And his, the people that knew him, he'd be in a bar drinking, doing drugs. And he'd be prophesying to people, people said. He had this gift and was still in operation, although it wasn't glorifying God. But there was a gift there. There are gifts in you. I pray that God would stir up the gift that you have in your life and that you would be like these apostles. Be totally surrendered. Be obedient. Recognize your need. I need you, Holy Spirit. I need you more today than yesterday. And I'll need you tomorrow than I do today. We need an intense desire. We need to pray. We need to believe. We need to have faith. If you'll do those things, take God at his word, he will fill you with the Holy Spirit and nothing will be impossible to you. No mountain will be able to keep you from crossing it. No river will keep you from being able to ford it. The power of God overrules this realm. Now some of you out there today, you don't even know Jesus. Some of you popped on just because you, maybe you've seen a few of my little messages or maybe somebody who loves you maybe is going to send you this message and I hope they do. And I want you to know that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Jesus Christ loves you and he will he has already paid for your sins on the mine. And you can be saved right now, right where you're at. If you would come to Jesus truly in your heart and say, God, I am a sinner. I have broken the heart of God. I've broken the law of God. And I'm asking you today to have mercy on my wicked soul. Remove from me my old self. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Make me brand new. And use me for your glory. From this day forward into eternity. If you pray that prayer, God has heard your prayer. And you'll be my brother, you'll be my sister. we got much work to do. May the Lord Jesus bless each one of you. Cause his face to shine upon you. If I don't see you any sooner, I will see you in heaven. Amen. Amen.